Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum and a good uh, afternoon. So let me continue with the lectures. Uh, I think the last thing that we did was to look at uh, this lecture on Zeeman effect and uh, we are looking at the case of van der Waals interaction. One of the things that uh, I did not quite do is, uh, so this is the Hamiltonian of the system for the uh, van der Waals interaction, so just let us recall a little bit. So the idea is to have uh, the two hydrogen atoms, okay? And then you have an electron on each uh, hydrogen atom, sort of orbiting uh, its nucleus. And uh, essentially, you will have your H naught to be the, the the Hamiltonian of your uh, two hydrogen atoms. Okay, so you have the uh, hydrogen atom one with the Coulomb potential here. And hydrogen atom two with the column uh, potential also, okay. But there will be interaction between the two, and uh, we have uh, discussed this. Okay, you have the ion ion or the nucleus nucleus interaction, and then this will be uh, the electron around. Uh, yeah, the electron around. Uh, this second hydrogen atom and also the, the first hydrogen atom and then essentially you have also the electron-electron uh, interaction. Okay, So uh, one of the things that we did uh, but did not quite dis discuss this because I didn't have time to, to, to look into it. So the, the potential over here we can actually uh, approximate it uh, in uh, some expansion of this power uh, uh, of the vector r i where i equals to 1 to n2 over the distance r uh, one can approximate this uh, potential to be the following now I didn't quite this uh, uh, call tell you how to do this but uh, apparently it's quite uh, tricky in some way uh, let me find my okay. so how to actually uh, uh, derive this is uh, so what I'm going to do because I don't have time to, to type everything in I just get some notes from from the web okay where and there was an explicit uh, call derivation of this. So it's almost similar with the one uh, in Sakurai's book. Okay. Only the, the labels are different. So what's this, what, what one does is to have this uh, recall that we had something like this. Okay. This is say term number one, term number two, and term number three one can do is to do as follows. So this is for term number one. Okay. So you have that uh, previously this was R plus R2. Okay. So one can uh, re-express this in terms of, no, the, this is essentially the magnitude. So the magnitude is just, uh, well, if you just take the vector, and then dot product with itself. Okay. And then you take the square root, that will be the magnitude. Okay. So essentially one can uh, expand this. So you get R squared, the capital R squared, which is your small R squared previously. And then uh, you have also the R2 dot R2, which gives you the R2 squared. And then you have the, the mixed term, the cross term. Okay, 
Now the cross term, uh, remember, recall that what we did, go back to the original picture, so you can see where this is the z axis. So the, the, the line connecting uh, the nucleus of the two hydrogen atoms is uh, is meant to be uh, uh, what you call pointing along the direction of the z axis. So in other words, the r dot r two. Sorry, it's the other page. R dot r two will be just uh, since r this r is pointing along the z direction. Okay, so essentially you get uh, the component from here will be just the, the Z. Okay, and what one does is now uh, most of this will have, oh, well, okay, uh, one of the things that we can actually do is to bring out this capital R or the small R previously uh, outside. So what happens over here, then the, the thing in the square root will be given in terms of uh, uh, a polynomial in terms of 1 over r and 1 over r squared. Okay. So similarly, one can do the same for r1 minus r or r minus r. Previously in our, in the Sakurai's book, it's this. Okay. Let's just go back a little bit. So, so you have that. Okay, this is term number two. So for this is two here, and then you can do the same thing. But remember, here you have a minus sign instead of a plus, so you have a minus sign over here. Okay, and similarly for the other one, let me go back to the original one first. It's r plus r of two minus r one. Okay, so one can actually see that also. Over here. Okay, so this is, uh, one should be looking at this. This can be written as, okay, same thing as uh, R minus, or R plus R2 minus R. And then uh, again, we use the same uh, expansion or the same you know, form of the square root, but uh, this one is a bit more complicated because you have this R2 together with R1. So you have this instead uh, rather than the R2 squared over R squared. Okay, so you have that. And uh, one of the things that one assume is that uh, this distance between the two hydrogen atom nucleus is much bigger than your uh, bore radius. Okay? Your bore radius is roughly the, the size of the hydrogen atom itself, okay? which is given here. Okay? So this is the size of your hydrogen atom. Okay? So what one does is to tailor expand the, 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 the square root that you have on the denominator in this way. And uh, one should be able to plot uh, this kind of approximation. It's quite messy, and I think it's best to keep the square term in. So that means you have a lot of the terms coming for each uh, expansion over here. Okay, so you have the the three different expansion here. This one, this one. And the one that's uh, having the this one, okay. So you do the expansion for this, and and then uh, what's gonna happen is that when you combine them, some of the things gets cancelled, okay, between the the three different terms. Uh, then uh, the the resulting uh, Hamiltonian order in this case. Uh, in the previous uh, notation is V, okay, the perturbing potential becomes uh, this expression, which is the expression 
that you get in Sakurai's book. Okay? And you can also see the other thing was uh, uh, the term that multiplies this. This is essentially like a dipole-dipole kind of uh, interaction. And uh, the thing that multiplies that was uh, essentially in terms of 1 over r cubed. Okay? So the 1 over r squared all cancels off. So one can, uh, it's, it's just the thing that, you no, know, some, some of the thing you can just you know, take it as given, but it's best to know uh, how to derive this. So you finally get to this, and then uh, also recall the other thing that we did was to look at the first order energy shift. So the first order energy shift, uh, uh, would imply uh, taking the expectation value of this okay? but here the expectation value of this about the uh, spherical harmonic okay, would just give you a zero okay? and uh, in this particular case uh, if you want to see the, the uh, sort of the perturbation uh, uh, non-trivial perturbation then you have to go to second order so the second order again uh, what happens in this particular case this factor becomes a square and uh, essentially you use the second order perturbation for the energy shift you get this uh, expectation value where you see the overlap between the the, the known uh, unperturbed ground state with uh, some other uh, state, the unperturbed state, okay, uh, allowing this to be uh, sort of uh, making the transition between the ground state and the, uh, the other excited states. Okay. Uh, again, there's some mistakes, so I will correct this. This is supposed to be EK0 swap them around okay uh, so uh, essentially what we have is in this particular case we have this 1 over r6 as your interaction okay and then the fact that oh uh, this is correct this is e not this is the one being swapped Okay, not this is not okay. So you have your ground state minus the excited state, but the excited state has 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 a uh, no is higher than your ground state. So this will be negative. Okay, so you have the negative multiply this uh, interaction. Okay, so you have uh, essentially what we uh, what we know as the Van der Waals interaction. It's uh, attractive because of the negative sign and then you have the long range uh, because you have this r to power minus 6 okay so uh, that more or less sort of completes uh, the lecture I will also you know, upload later on I have not uploaded all this yet uh, I will upload both these uh, notes which I get from the internet okay uh, try to put the author's name if I can find it back and uh, uh, put this on Putra Blast. So the next thing that we want to do is to go to lecture 14. Again, it's just, uh, I'm, I'm just having a uh, difficult time to, to complete everything. So I just had some few uh, notes, which are no, essentially coming from Sakurai's book. So today we are looking at uh, variational methods, and then hopefully we go into interaction picture. So one of the things that uh, we have in the context of perturbation theory, you always assume there will be some uh, known unperturbed case where you know the, the solutions and you know the uh, exact uh, eigenvalues. Okay, but uh, usually you don't really have this. 
particularly if the, the, the system is complex, then you probably need to find uh, the unperturbed case uh, for the unperturbed case, not the perturbed case. Okay? For the unperturbed case, you need to find some other way to make estimates about the unperturbed energy or under unperturbed uh, states. Okay? So one of the uh, techniques which is also falls under uh, approximation methods in quantum mechanics is to use variational methods. Okay. So the idea here, uh, essentially, if you do not know that the true ground state, you consider any possible trial state as a guess for the true ground state. So this is just a guess. Hopefully, it approximates uh, the true ground state. And uh, what we're going to do is to compute your expectation value of your Hamiltonian, okay, your energy, with respect to this uh, trial state. Okay. And of course, uh, what you're going to get is not, you, you won't get the, the, the ground state energy, but you get something which is higher. So there's a theorem that one can actually prove quite easily that this uh, expectation value that you get from the trial ground state is always bigger than your true ground state. Okay, uh, this is just a mere expansion. For example, because the 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 uh, trial ground state is not the true ground state, right? So one can actually express this uh, just like any any uh, state can be expressed in terms of uh, no. in terms of your energy states. Okay, so this will uh, act as a basis. And your coefficients over here will be just simply EI psi. Okay. So uh, one can do that for this trial state. So this will be your uh, energy states for which uh, this is true okay and one can substitute this inside your h bar okay. so what one can do is now we have that okay but now i'm going to express this as uh, this ek over here you can express as this uh, so you get uh, this being replaced by that, but you also have the E0 case. And what happens in that particular case, there will be some orthogonality, uh, uh, what you call. So you use some orthogonality properties, okay, for which you can, uh, uh, what should I say? Uh, you can actually cancel top and bottom in some way. Okay, I, can, I can't remember precisely how uh, at the moment because I didn't quite uh, do the calculation myself. But uh, essentially you can do this. So uh, you will just, yeah, I mean, let, let's just do this uh, uh, in an instant. So what's left inside over here would be some K modulus k 0 tilde square e naught. Yeah, okay. That's very trivial. Okay. So you have that, which is the thing extra that we get. But e naught is not part of sum. Okay. So you can bring it outside. Okay. And then you just have this sum over this sum, which are identical. Okay. So that should be trivial. So finally, uh, we have something over here. And uh, one of the things that, uh, let's just get rid of this. Okay. Uh, one thing that you should see over here, this is actually a positive quantity. So something over here is all positive, 
plus e naught, that must be greater uh, greater than or equals to e naught. Okay. So in other words, your estimate or your ground state using the expectation value uh, with the trial state is always bigger than your your true ground state. Okay. So and uh, also the the other thing you have the equality. The equality thing uh, will be true if you have your trial uh, ground state to be uh, the trial state to be exactly equals to the true ground state. Now uh, we have not done any variation of uh, kind of thing. Uh, we'll come in a minute. So uh, one of the things that we can actually see if 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 for some reason that uh, this trial state is in terms of uh, the, with respect to the true ground state uh, is given by uh, an error of say order epsilon okay. so in other words uh, you look at the, the true ground state or together with the, the, the trial state Okay, uh, the, the difference between the two is just of order epsilon. Then what you will get from the above, okay, because of this term, you will get the energy uh, difference between the, the, the estimate and the true ground state is of the order epsilon squared okay so in other words if you have an order uh, order of epsilon, epsilon uh, difference between the, the true ground state and the trial state then you always have only uh, the epsilon squared so this is quite if you think of epsilon to be small over here then this is already a good uh, estimate for your true ground state okay. or you can do it uh, in this now we start to, to introduce this idea of variation so you can think of this uh, no you have a trial state and then you you allow this to be uh, varying with respect to uh, the, the trial state and what uh, and this variation is in such a way that you minimize your h bar. So in other words, the variation that you need is in such a way that uh, under this variation, you need to uh, extremize uh, this uh, quantity. Okay. And uh, what you're going to get from the above statement, if this is of order uh, delta uh, well delta of this uh, state okay then your energy difference the error in your estimates of your energy over here will be of the order of the square of that okay so now you'll be able to see that okay one one of the things that one can do is to start thinking of allowing this uh, trial state to depend on some parameter and then you vary with respect to this parameter okay so that's the thing that we're going to do uh, so one can frame uh, the whole thing over here by saying that okay your trial cat uh, will depend okay will depend on some parameters, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on. Uh, it depends on how complicated you want it to be, okay? So once you have these parameters going on there, then you allow this to uh, to be extremized with respect to this. Uh, I think this should be a h bar here. Uh, one can extremize the, the expectation value with respect to these parameters and then uh, you set this derivative equal to zero. Okay. So once you have uh, these equations, so you need to solve for lambda one, lambda two, and so on. 
and then uh, once you get uh, you, once you, you are able to solve this lambda 1 and lambda 2 you substitute back into the, the tri-state and then recalculate your h bar and that will actually give you the minimized h bar okay so uh, one can look at some examples uh, one of the easy examples I'm not quite sure uh, whether you have seen this before uh, you can actually estimate the ground state okay uh, using some some form of uh, uh, intuition okay where you know that it's going to be a uh, exponential decay with respect to distance okay so there will be a scale over here which is given by a and a will be our uh, varying parameter okay so we can actually do this uh, I can actually do this and minimize each bar at that uh, using this uh, try state okay and then you should be able to get your ground state energy to be there which is precisely the ground state of your hydrogen atom and here your A becomes uh, extremized as your ball radius I'll let you to explore this there's another way of actually proving this uh, using uh, uh, I think if I, if you have done quantum mechanics under me you probably have seen this in in terms of minimizing your uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle okay so you can actually get your ground state by minimizing minimizing that so okay let's look at uh, a particular workout example given on the book okay this is the case of the one-dimensional infinite well again trying to do everything in a rush this is spelling mistake there so one-dimensional infinite well which is a, a, a box potential remember this kind of thing x this is minus a this is a so your your what you call your particles sort of uh, moves moves inside this uh, potential potential well okay but it cannot go outside because you have an infinite potential to, to overcome okay so this is given by that and this is supposed to be one of the easiest uh, problem to solve in in the first course of quantum mechanics and you can actually get uh, your solution for this to be a cosine function. So you remember this would correspond to something like this. You just consider what kind of standing wave that's available. And the lowest one will be a cosine wave. And then this is followed by a sine wave and so on and so forth. Okay? So the standing wave is given uh, the lowest one is given by a cos curve so the cos uh, cosine curve uh, and there's only a half oscillation there okay. so uh, you can check this out from your first course and then you'll be able to also calculate what's the ground state energy for that okay, by uh, looking at the the momenta okay, that correspond to that uh, wavelength Right. Uh, suppose uh, just to uh, to essentially make this as an example to do a variational principle. Uh, what is this again? I'm doing everything in a rush. So what one does is to consider any function that sort of uh, disappears at the end point because it cannot tunnel through. So outside your wave function is zero so by continuity we need to have your wave function to be zero at the end points okay so one uh, possibility is uh, to consider just a polynomial rather than cosine curve then we can uh, estimate this by a parabola okay. this almost look like a parabola already okay so so you can have that as your trial ground state 
okay and uh, at this stage there's no parameter no free parameter here your a here is not is essentially fixed okay. that's the boundary of your potential so there's no real free parameter there but you can now still compute uh, uh, with respect to uh, this uh, trial state okay can compute the uh, what we call the energy expectation value so in, in, in the case of the the the, the, the thing in the uh, potential well this would be just your p squared on 2m so your Hamiltonian so your p squared becomes a, a second order derivative so you take the the wave function over here and then uh, apply the, the second order derivative on one of the uh, so this is just like psi star p squared psi okay so uh, you went with this and I remember this is not uh, sometimes it's not normalized in fact this is not normalized so you need to, to normalize it uh, below using uh, psi star psi Okay, so you can can do the algebra, which I did not bother to check. Okay, uh, do the algebra, and then you should be able to get this expression. Compare this with the true ground state. This is about uh, slightly above uh, e naught, the, the the true ground state. And in fact, you can calculate the percentage. This is uh, uh, above 1 which is 0 0.013 so that means it's 1.3 percent of the true ground state which is quite close already to the, the true ground state okay but remember over here there's no variation that you have done okay it's just you have a tri ground state and then you just simply calculate your expectation value so in order to introduce uh, Variation. So this is where my, I think where I'm going to have my notes finish at this point. Uh, one can uh, introduce some parameter here as a power. Okay, remember our uh, earlier uh, parabola is something like that. Okay. So when you put x equals to plus or minus a. This will give you zero. Okay, so you just need to obey that kind of uh, behavior. So it doesn't have to be a square. You can have it to be to some power lambda. And then when you put x equals to plus or minus a, uh, this thing will just disappear, vanish. Okay, so your lambda can be set to be your uh, uh, varying parameters. So now, since I don't have anything else inside these notes, I will go to the book itself. Okay. Uh, so one can now substitute this wave function into your h bar and simply calculate it. It's a it's going to be a bit messy in this particular case but you can actually calculate it and you get this h bar over here okay and uh, what one does okay there's only one parameter here your lambda so you can take uh, dh bar d lambda to be equal to zero okay and then find what what lambda sort of uh, minimizes this h bar and that is found to be this particular irrational value 1 plus root 6 on 2 okay and once you have that so you have a value for your lambda you can just substitute that into the trial state and recalculate your h bar again and in this particular case you get a better estimate which is now uh, slightly larger than E naught by 
say I think about 0. Uh, 0.03%. Okay. Oops. Three percent. Zero point three percent. Sorry, zero point three percent. Okay, and uh, that is better from the previous case. Was what? The previous case was. Is it? One point three percent. Okay. And that is just you no. Know, uh, parametrizing the the powers instead. Okay. So you can uh, start start doing all sort of uh, different kind of uh, parameterization if you want to. Okay. Uh, so this one uh, probably you will just skip. This just to see how close is the 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 trial state with, uh, with respect to the true ground state. Okay. So the next thing that we want to do is essentially the idea of a, a interaction picture. So this is uh, towards what uh, Timothy wants, uh, the time in the time uh, dependent perturbation theory. So we need to go into interaction picture. Did you do? Uh, did you guys do uh, Schrodinger picture and Heisenberg picture before this? Okay. Uh, all right. Let, let me see. let me see. Okay. Uh, because I don't have notes for this at, at the moment. So, uh, essentially, okay. Uh, this. Okay. Let me just probably uh, just uh, before going to interaction picture, then I can just mention about Schrodinger, Schrodinger picture. So in Schrodinger picture is that your observables are constant. Well, they are not constant. What I mean is they don't do any, uh, uh, there's no time dependence here. Okay. And your state will be totally uh, time dependent. Okay. So that's the reason why in this particular case that you solve uh, for your state okay, in terms of a Schrodinger equation. There is another picture which is actually the, the original picture of uh, quantum mechanics which is uh, the earlier than Schrodinger's picture which is Heisenberg picture. Uh, the idea is over here is that your observer will have time dependence. And then your state will have no time dependence. So all your time dependence are thrown into the observables. And this is uh, usually in terms of, you know, uh, in this particular case, uh, your states, okay, let's go back to the Schrodinger picture. I'm not sure whether this has been discussed here. Let me just check. Okay, maybe, okay. I'll just give you the overall idea. Uh, you remember over here in the Schrodinger picture, what do you do? You time you off the state. Okay, your psi goes from T naught, goes to psi T, psi T, where psi t is given by an evolution operator multiplied with psi t naught. Okay? And what is this time evolution operator? It's essentially E minus I H T minus T naught here over H bar. Okay? So that is in terms of Schrodinger picture and your observables, whatever whatever it is, your O or your X, your P or your L, for example, will not have any time dependence. OK? 
everything is actually thrown, the time dependence is thrown into your states. In the Heisenberg picture, your states doesn't change. So there is no time dependence. If you look at T psi T here, it's just the same as psi T naught. Okay, but your observer can change uh, by having this notation. Let's say I consider operator O here. This is the way it's, uh, the way it changed. Okay, uh, I'm not quite sure whether you have seen that before, but uh, you can actually do this. The idea is that uh, what is important in be between these two pictures, you always get the physical uh, prediction. In this case, the physical predictions are given by expectation values. Your physical predictions by expect uh, given by expectation values doesn't uh, change from one picture to the other picture. Okay, so you always get the same uh, prediction, so to speak. How is this possible is essentially if you look in, in this particular case here. So here is a, a, a state. This is at, uh, inside your Schrodinger picture. Okay. What do you do when you do uh, a time evolution? Then you introduce uh, your evolution operator. So then uh, if this is going to be uh, taken as your energy states, then uh, your time evolution operator will just give you these phase factors. Okay. Uh, something else here. Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, in this particular case, I'm, I'm assuming certain things. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's, it's the same kind of thing. Okay, so in other words, uh, what you have over here is like, suppose I don't have this, okay. What I have is when it evolves with respect to time, I will just have this. And now, Okay, this will be multiplying your energy states. Okay, so what happens now, I can consider this as CNT, a time-dependent uh, coefficient. Okay, so what happens in this particular case, this time-dependence coefficient, I can absorb this inside your observer. Remember that I always have something like this uh, for your expectation value. Okay, so this will be psi O psi. So now what do I do? This will be coming from your, you know, your UT, your time evolution operator. So now what do I do is, remember this will be time evolve. Okay, so this you take it to be at time t, this will be at time zero. What do I do here will be u dagger o u psi. Okay, so, so this is essentially the thing that we had earlier. Okay, but now instead of absorbing into the states, I can absorb these operators together with this u dagger into your operators and that will be the Heisenberg picture. Okay, so in other words what happens over here the time dependence you can throw this you know, accordingly uh, whichever way you want. Okay, so you can throw it in terms of the operators or you can throw it inside your states. And then if you throw inside your states, then you'll be solving Schrodinger equation. If you throw inside your observables, then you have uh, this Heisenberg equation of motion.
But now you can say, okay, if I can sort of throw my time dependence whichever way I want, why not just throw the time dependence, you know, uh, the complicated ones, I will throw it inside your states or uh, and partial of the time dependence goes inside your observable. So you can have sort of split, splitting your time dependence into two parts. Okay. So the one that you don't want to, to go into the observable, then you throw it in, inside your states. So that is essentially uh, the idea of a uh, uh, interaction picture. Okay. So here, for example, this is given in terms of your H0 and V. Okay. So here is your, this is your, uh, observable uh, in terms of what I call showing a picture. It doesn't have any time dependence here. Okay. But I can make this to be uh, time dependent by throwing in your evolution operator. Okay. In this way. So this is like your U just now, U, U dagger. Okay. Uh, but now Suppose I have your Hamiltonian given by these two parts, the H0 plus some interaction uh, potential. Okay, so I can uh, split into into this H0 goes into the, your your observable, and the other one will go into your states. Okay, your your V going go into the state. So that is going to be our interaction picture. So let me just check because I have not prepared for this. Yeah, probably I will. Okay. Uh, maybe I should stop over here so that I can prepare this uh, better and give you the lecture in the next lecture. So. Um, one of the things, we only have three lectures left and I'm desperate for time over here. Uh, I will try to finish off your time dependent uh, perturbation theory. So there will be two chapters which I would not be able to cover. Okay, uh, let me go to the table of contents. Uh, so we are at this chapter now. Okay. Uh, usually I skip scattering theory. Uh, scattering theory is important if you do uh, uh, experiments. Okay. When you scatter off particles. Okay. Uh, this is particularly true if you do particle physics or nuclear physics. So uh, in terms of our emphasis over here, none of us uh, actually go going into this scattering uh, theory, at least not in this context. I was hoping to finish off this chapter 7 and hopefully to go into chapter 8. But it seems, no, I'll be stuck with only with the perturbation theory. Okay, so depending on how much interest you have into these two remaining chapters, uh, maybe uh, uh, I can do this uh, outside the course. You know. So I will try to complete off your perturbation theory, which is chapter five. Okay. I hope that's okay for everyone. And if we have interest to go into the other chapters, the last two chapters, then we can try to do it uh, in some other time besides the course. Some, some other time is bad. Well, I mean, uh, no, uh, I need to, to prepare anyway, you know, and next semester I also 
uh, have to return to statistical mechanics, which I don't really have notes on, as you probably have seen before. So I will probably use a simpler book for the next course of statistical mechanics, not this book. Uh, so I will still have to prepare for those courses, which is stat, mech, and math method. Okay. So if you want, probably, no, I can, no, on and off, do the, the, the last two chapters if you want, just for your knowledge, say. Whenever, okay, whenever. Because, because I need to, to, to also uh, start doing your exam questions, okay, well, next week. So I need to fix what I'm supposed to teach you. Okay, let me take uh, the attendance first. Okay. So, are there any uh, thing? Uh, when are you going to submit your SCL? All of you have to do it in within one group, so should not be. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're supposed uh, to. Could, could, could we have it by the end of next week? Yeah, why not? I mean, uh, uh, because there's only one group in this particular class, so it's okay. Okay. You, All right. Okay. Thank exactly, you, everyone. Doctor. Yeah? When, when exactly is the due date? Like the end of next week is next weekend, is it? Can we have it before the next weekend? <laughs> next Friday? I think it's possible. All right, okay. sure. Just, okay. 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 So, so, okay, that's it for today. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye.